During the Nazi occupation of Rome, the Third Reich attempted to kidnap and assassinate the world's foremost Christian leader. This was one of Hitler's most ambitious plans, but ultimately it was never carried out. Nevertheless, the reasons for this decision are not entirely clear, and many clues still lie hidden deep within the Vatican archives. Despite nearly 80 years passing since the end of World War II, one question continues to stir controversy among historians. Were the Vatican and the Catholic Church involved in the atrocities committed by the Third Reich in Europe? And why did Hitler order the assassination of the Supreme Pontiff? These questions often raise significant debates about a pivotal figure of the time, Pope Pius XIII, who presided over the Vatican throughout World War II. His tenure was marked by internal struggles within the Vatican itself, between cardinals who supported Hitler's anti-Semitic policies and vehement opponents of the Nazi regime. This led Pius Thur and the Fuhrer into great antagonism, to the extent that each plotted against the other. On October 20, 1939, Pope Pius XIII issued his first papal encyclical, a public letter addressed to the entire Catholic community with a strong anti-Nazi message. Who among the soldiers of Christ does not feel compelled and spurred on to greater vigilance, to a more determined resistance, in the face of the increasingly numerous ranks of Christ's enemies, when he perceives that the proponents of these tendencies deny or neglect in practice the life-giving truths and values inherent in belief in God and in Christ. These were the words with which Eugenio Pacelli, known from that year as Pius V, began his papacy. The Italian was elected as the Supreme Pontiff following the death of his predecessor, who had witnessed the rise of anti-Semitic movements in Germany and vehemently opposed Adolf Hitler. Pacelli ascended to the papacy supporting his predecessor's resistance, believing that the extremist, racist, and violent stance of the German dictator threatened the spirit of the Catholic faith. In fact, a year before becoming Pius XIII, he publicly declared, It is impossible for a Christian to participate in anti-Semitism. It is inadmissible. Spiritually, we are all Semites. Emphasizing the idea that Jesus and his disciples were Jews, Pacelli, then a ecclesiastical diplomat aspiring to the papacy, sought to diminish support for fascist movements within the church itself, thus aligning himself in the eyes of the College of Cardinals. However, at the same time, this stance earned him strong criticism from the fascist regimes of the time. Faced with the possibility of Pacelli being elected as head of state of the Vatican, both Hitler and Mussolini tried to intervene politically in the discussions, although they failed to prevent the designation of the new pope. With a position contrary to the anti-Semitic will, pulsing through much of Europe, Pacelli assumed the greatest responsibility of the Catholic Church. With war looming on the horizon, not even the father himself could foresee the magnitude of the tragedy about to befall the world. While Pius the Flein settled into the throne of the Vatican, Adolf Hitler analyzed the situation from his operations desk in Berlin. The arrival of another opposing pope was something the Fuhrer preferred to avoid, and he believed he had taken measures to prevent it. Firstly, with the Reichskonkordat in 1933, this was an agreement between his government and the Holy See that allowed freedom of Catholic worship throughout Germany, including the teaching of religion in schools as well as protection for institutions, churches, and clergy across the territory in case of war. With Pacelli's rise, Hitler and Goebbels, the Reich's Minister of Propaganda, considered the possibility of repealing the Reichskonkordat to try to keep any opposition from the ecclesiastical body in check. However, they deemed it a risky move since it could alienate a significant portion of the population that adhered to religion something they would later see in France and Italy. Initially, the Fuhrer decided to wait and closely monitor the Pope, 
opting for a strategy of counterblow rather than provocation. Meanwhile, Pacelli faced his own share of internal political problems within the Vatican. The end of the 1930s left Europe deeply fractured, not territorially, but with serious crises of political and religious representation in all countries. Regarding the Holy See, Catholics were not victims of the same persecution as the Jews in the region. However, the proximity of the Soviet Union and its staunch determination to create a society without religion led many important Christian clergymen and politicians to support Hitler's positions. The editors of the Vatican magazine La Civiltà Cattolica were deeply anti-Semitic during those years and, as a gesture of neutrality towards freedom of expression, Pius XIII allowed them to continue their activities. At the same time, and in a contradictory sense, he appointed several Jewish academics as Vatican officials after they were expelled from Italian universities by Benito Mussolini. While the Pope tried to dissuade regional leaders to prevent war, he maintained close dialogues with U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt and warned European leaders of the imminent dangers. But the conflict was unstoppable. Following the fall of Poland to the German Blitzkrieg, the strategy of rapid advance overwhelming the enemy with tanks, France and the Netherlands were the next targets of the Fuhrer. Internal resistance to Nazism was sustained by officials, politicians, and military personnel who rejected the anti-Semitic stance of the movement. Since 1938, they secretly organized to facilitate the escape of Jews and hinder the machinery of the Holocaust. Within the German army, some officers began planning a coup against Hitler. Colonel Hans Oster was one of the most famous internal opponents of the Reich, believing that its policies were incompatible with Christian values. Seeking logistical support from the church, Oster sent lawyer Joseph Miller to request political assistance from the Supreme Pontiff. The Pope decided to intervene and coordinate dialogue between the German rebels and British intelligence represented by Duke Francis Darcy Osborne. This collaboration strengthened defensive positions for both the British and in Belgium and the Netherlands. Although it did not achieve much against the Nazi advance, when this conspiracy was uncovered, it was seen as a direct attack and the Pope was accused of espionage. However, there were no immediate reprisals. By 1940, Pius the Theme had to face the defeat of his diplomatic efforts. The Western Front was slowly falling to the relentless German onslaught, and Winston Churchill no longer showed interest in dialoguing with the Supreme Pontiff. The United States maintained its stance of neutrality, and Benito Mussolini blocked the influence of the Holy See beyond his political borders. Despite being in an oppositional stance, Pacelli decided to continue his war against Hitler. Through encyclicals and secret communications spread clandestinely, akin to Jesus' teachings during the early days of Catholicism, he urged Christians of conscience to care for their neighbors and help the Jews. The Pope called for love and charity for the persecuted Semites of Europe, and although his message did not reach the major institutions such as governments or armies, it did resonate within small resistance groups. Officially and in view of the world, Pius XIII chose to cease openly confronting Hitler and began a period of uncomfortable neutrality that would lead to a decline in public opinion of him. In Berlin, the Führer was still unsure how to deal with the Catholic Church. He leaned towards responding as Stalin did with intense persecution following the socialist tradition. However, Nazism was also a deeply conservative movement, and while anti-Christian propaganda grew month by month alongside the war, for the moment it was the domain of Minister Goebbels, not the army. Hitler had evidence that the French resistance and Belgian guerrillas were receiving support from the Vatican. Churches were used as refugees, with networks of tunnels beneath the buildings allowing resistance groups to move stealthily or escape. They also served as offices where priests forged visas and documents that enabled the persecuted to cross borders. Yet collaborators with Nazism also needed their faith to clear their minds and keep their souls calm, further intensifying ideological rivalry within the church. Hitler decided to exploit these internal problems. 
He knew he needed clergy on his side to maintain calm among the population and troops. If you're going to carry out a genocide, you must have God on your side. But the solution came naturally, as neither Pius XIII wanted to expose his dialogue with the resistance, nor did the Fuhrer want to appear as an extremist against all religions. Especially since his speech to invade the Soviet Union was based on insisting that they were a barbaric, immoral people, far removed from the civilized customs of the West. However, neither had success in their strategies. Operation Barbarossa was a resounding failure, and the Pope's image began to decline around the world. The involvement of the United States and Canada in the war changed the paradigm of the conflict, and Western Christian values once again became a symbol for those opposed to Hitler's advance. The silence of the Supreme Pontiff began to be seen as complicity and fear rather than prudence. By 1942, the moral prestige of the Holy See was at its lowest point, and the Pope received letters from priests across Europe warning him that the massacres of Jews were reaching horrifying proportions and forms. Feeling great helplessness and faced with constant demands from ambassadors of the Allied countries, the Supreme Pontiff was forced back into the spotlight. That Christmas of the same year, he spoke to the world and delivered a harsh message against Nazism. He called for a commitment to assist the most vulnerable of the time, making a reference to the Jews. Humanity owes this pledge to the countless exiles whom the hurricane of war has torn from their native land and who can make their own the words of the prophet. Our inheritance has become strangers, our home, foreigners. Humanity owes this lament to the hundreds of thousands of people who, through no fault of their own, sometimes only because of their nationality or race, have been condemned to death or to slow extermination. With these words, without directly naming them, the Pope confirmed to the fascists that he was back at the forefront of political combat. The Reich security main office, led by the SS, harshly condemned the message, stating that the Supreme Pontiff had finally sided with the Jewish criminals and opposed the lifestyle of the Aryan Germans, considered the upstanding citizens. Thus, in Hitler's eyes, Pacelli became the representative of evil on earth. The transgression of the Vatican could not go unpunished, and the Fuhrer decided that he had had enough of Pius XIII. In early 1943, the Nazi leader began planning the assassination of the Pope. The situation had escalated. Italy was occupied by the Nazis, and with Rome open, the Vatican was within reach. Occupying the Holy See, eliminating the supreme leader, and opposing cardinals to replace them with clergy sympathetic to Nazism was a great temptation for the dictator. In one stroke, the Fuhrer could sweep away all ethical opposition, which cast shadows of moral doubt on his final solution. The plan to exterminate all Jews and extend the Aryan way of life. For this reason, Adolf ordered the Reich security main office to carry out the kidnapping of the Pope and transport him to the northern part of the country, where he would be executed. The operation was to be conducted by the SS, but the involvement of individuals close to the Supreme Pontiff was necessary to ensure the capture process would not be bloody. On September 13, 1943, General Karl Wolf received the order to execute the mission and began planning the coup. The major problem was gaining access to the Pope's inner circle as he surrounded himself with clergy and guards sympathetic to his political stance, making it difficult to infiltrate their ranks. While there was collaboration between Catholic priests and the Nazis, especially those closer to Mussolini, Pius XIV kept them at bay and tried not to get involved with the opposition. Karl Wolf needed to convert or corrupt the highest levels of the Curia for the plan to succeed. With the advance of the United States and the Soviet Union towards Rome, the SS general considered it best to spread the rumor that the Allies were attempting to capture the Pope and the Cardinals. Therefore, they needed to move them to a safe place. Little did they know, they would be fleeing from a false enemy 
and putting the life of the Supreme Pontiff into the bloody hands of the Nazis. The plan seemed foolproof. While the SS escorted Pacelli, the Nazis could occupy the Vatican, reorganize the government, secure the invaluable historical documents and the vast treasure hidden underground. Thus, fulfilling Hitler's greatest desire, more and more power. To achieve his goal, Wolf needed to negotiate with Italian forces. Some historians point to this as the weak point of his plan because the Holy Father held a very special place among his countrymen, even among the cruelest elements of fascism. They would hardly betray him. While the exact reason remains unknown, the operation to kidnap the Pope never took place. There are two versions. The first suggests that due to the turning tide of the war in favor of the Allies, the Germans decided not to proceed with the attempt to avoid paying a political cost, even greater than what they faced for the Holocaust. The second proposes that it was the Italians contacted by Wolf who leaked the plan to the Vatican, alerting the Pope. There exists a document indicating that Pacelli planned to escape to Portugal, which supports this hypothesis. While Pius the Thumna did not need to flee from the grasp of the Nazis, they escalated violence against Romans by launching deep raids in front of the Vatican windows, allowing the Pope to watch helplessly as his people were subjugated. During this time, Pacelli would order church members to assist Jews, providing them with refuge and safe passage worldwide. However, some historians suggest that he also forced many Jews to convert to Catholicism to access this aid, though this remains a highly debated point. In 1944, the Allies liberated Rome from Nazi rule, and Pius XIII met with Winston Churchill, requesting clemency for Italians who had collaborated with Mussolini and Hitler. This caused significant controversy as it implied they would not be judged similarly to German soldiers. Nevertheless, the Pope continued to demonstrate deep opposition to the Nazi regime for the remainder of the war, earning him great respect from Allied leaders and representatives of Judaism. In fact, on September 23, 1945, the Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, Dr. Leon Kubowitzki, sent money to the Vatican in recognition of the Holy See's efforts in rescuing victims of fascist and Nazi persecutions. According to some estimates from that time, between 700,000 and 860,000 Jews may have been saved thanks to the Church's intervention. This figure has been questioned as has the Pope's silence during the early stages of the Holocaust. However, Pope Pius XIII, formerly known as Eugenio Pacelli, survived Hitler's hatred and continued his tenure until his death in 1958. With lights and shadows, the history of contradictions, plots, and confrontations between two powerful leaders also portrays the most conflict-ridden era humanity has ever experienced. Thank you very much for joining us in another video. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to leave us a like and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.